Hi, I'm Jay McClellan, and in this video I'm making a travel-size cribbage and backgammon uh, game set as a gift for my niece and her husband. Uh, here's what I have in mind. So on the outside there's going to be a cribbage board. I'm going to drill all these holes with uh, my CNC router. There's about 250 holes on the top, so I'm going to use the router to drill that pattern of holes. And then on the inside uh, it's going to be a backgammon board. So on the inside, they requested this uh, purple and green color scheme. So I'm going to use the CNC router to cut the points of the backgammon board in the game surface. I'm going to uh, route a channel and then fill that in with colored epoxy. It's going to be epoxy mixed with mica powder, which it's a common technique, but I haven't done it before. So it's a new technique for me, and I'm looking forward to trying it. I'm going to make the project out of this large cherry board. And at first glance, it's a pretty horrible looking piece of wood. It's got a big crack down the middle. It's twisted. Uh, there's a lot wrong with it. But I'm making a small project, and I really only need a small section of wood. And there's a really nice section right here where the grain is very close to vertical. And that's going to help make the game board stable so that it doesn't tend to cup as, uh, as humidity changes. So to mill the wood, I'll start by rough cutting the areas that I want to use out of this large board. Uh, the smaller I get them, the easier it will be to straighten them out. And then I'll flatten one side on my jointer so that I have one side at least flat enough to be stable as it runs through the planer. Then I'll use my planer to uh, make the two sides parallel and surface them so I have a good clean surface on the wood. Once I've got it planed down, and I'm going to remove as little wood as possible in doing so, so that I can maintain as much thickness as possible. I'll resaw it on the bandsaw. I'm going to set up the fence of the bandsaw so that it saws right down the middle, as close as I can get, to, uh, to cut it in half. And then I'm going to surface the cut sides and do that again on them, cut them right down the middle, as close as I can get, and surface the cut sides. So I've got my stock milled up. I, uh, I mill it down to 3 8 inch wide, and I was able to get four pieces, four layers, out of my two inch thick board. So I have enough for two game boards, because uh, each one will take a pair of these. And um, I also milled up uh, a couple of extra pieces in, this is just birch, so it's kind of scrap wood, but that'll let me test the cuts on the CNC on some scraps before I cut it on the real, uh, on the real wood. And then I also cut the side pieces, also three eighths of an inch thick, and I have four of those, so I have enough each, uh, each game board is going to take two of these and two of these. So I've got enough for, uh, for two complete boards. Here's an end view of the wood that I cut for the game board surfaces. And you can see that for the most part I was able to get it so that the grain direction is close to vertical. It's a little bit more curved on this end, but, and it's slanted a little here, but uh, by and large it's close to vertical grain uh, or quarter sawn wood. That's going to make this a lot more stable because as it absorbs moisture, absorbs humidity from the air, or releases humidity to the air, depending on changes in, in the ambient humidity, it's, uh, it's not going to tend to curve one way or the other as much as, as simply change in width. So I still have to allow for some wood movement in the, final, uh, in the final board so that the wood can expand and contract, but at least it shouldn't be cupping one way or the other very much because it's close to quarter sawn. I designed the project using Fusion 360, and I also exported this 3D model to Blender software in order to make that nifty 3D animation that I showed at the start. I created this roughing tool path using a 1 8 inch uh, bit to remove most of the material from the pockets in the backgammon board, and then I created a finishing tool path using a much smaller bit to remove just the remaining material that I need in order to get these sharp points. Now I'll set up my CNC router to route pockets in the backgammon board. And I want to get it, uh, I want the board to be roughly here in the CNC router. It's not real critical, but I do want it to get it very precisely aligned this way so it's aligned with the x-axis of my CNC router. And to do that I've got these alignment disks. Uh, they're very simple, they're just a piece of plywood that I cut out with a, um, a hole saw and then they have a T-bolt on the bottom, and they can slide in my slot table. And I've got these two in the back, and I'm going to take the board out, and I want to align these exactly with the x-axis of the router so that they register the board when I put it in. To align the two back disks with the x-axis of the router, 
I've got a plain shaft in the router collet, uh, not a cutting bit, just a plain straight shaft. And I'm going to slide these uh, discs, they're loose, easy to slide. I'm going to slide them up against the bit just lightly. And then I'll jog, very slowly jog the router across the surface of that circle. And that way it pushed it until it's just aligned with the far edge of that bit. And now I can tighten this disc down. I'll hold it with my fingers very carefully to make sure it doesn't move. Now that's snug down so it can't move and I'll repeat the process with the other disc. Now I'll add the third disc on the side as a stop for the side of the board and the position of this one is arbitrary. It's just going to give me a repeatable location. Now that I have my three round stops installed, I can slide a board in and register it very repeatably against these stops. So that'll let me route pockets in here, take a board out and put another board in and route pockets in that one. And each time I put them in, I can get them back in and align to uh, very, very, very close to the same position. To hold the boards in place, I'll just bring in these uh, clamps. So uh, this is why I made my boards extra long. So I've got about an inch and a half on each edge of extra space for, uh, for clamping the board down. Now I need to zero out the axes of the CNC router and in my toolpath I've set it up so that uh, X and Y zero is at the very center of the game board. So I drew a, a cross on the center of this board just by connecting the corners and I've got in the router bit a very fine point bit and I'm just going to align that point with the center point of the board by jogging it with the, um, with the CNC controller. So now I've got uh, all axes set at zero at this point. Here's a close-up of the router bits I'm going to use. These are uh, two flute spiral down cut bits. So as the bit rotates in its normal rotation, the flutes are actually pushing material down into the pocket, which is kind of the opposite of the more common case. But by cutting with a downward shearing action, it uh, makes a cleaner cut along the edge of the pocket where it doesn't tend to pull wood fibers up uh, at the edge. And the bit on the left is a 1 8 inch diameter that I'll use for roughing out most of the material. And then the bit on the right is a 1 32nd inch diameter that I'll use for the finishing pass. I'll put links in the video description where you can buy these and the other tools and materials I'm using. So to zero the z-axis, I'm going to move it down very slowly onto this piece of paper. And right there, I can feel a little resistance on the paper. So it's, uh, it's very close. Now, yes, it may be a thickness of a piece of paper above the surface of the wood, but that's okay for this purpose. It doesn't have to be super exact. And now I'll zero out the Z axis only so that my X, Y, and Z are all set. Now it's time to test my CNC program before running it for real. So first I've loaded up a piece of the uh, birch wood. So this is kind of scrap wood. I've also raised the bit 10 millimeters and then zeroed out the Z axis. So it's now set at zero, 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 but the bit is actually 10 millimeters above the part and um, my cutting only goes a couple millimeters down. So basically I'm going to cut air first and hopefully make sure that nothing uh, goes terribly wrong. And I generally have my, my hand on the e-stop button while I do this. <laughs> As it's running, what I'm looking for is any potential collisions with my clamps. If it's getting within 10 millimeters of the top of the clamp, I have a potential problem. And uh, also just a sanity check that actually it's cutting on the part and not off to the side. And then assuming it looks okay, we'll uh, reset the Z-axis and uh, run it for real. Okay, I've got everything enabled. I've got the spindle enabled. And so now the spindle should start when I run the program and we'll actually start cutting some wood. Well, 
in general that worked okay. Uh, for the most part the toolpath did what it was supposed to do. It cut the, the uh, initial pockets, so these are the rough cut pockets for the points. Uh, however, I got something weird going on in this first pocket. Let's take a closer look. You can see these are the first two pockets that it cut, and the second one looks pretty normal, but the first one has this weird strip mine kind of effect where it started out cutting a lot deeper and then got shallower as it went. And it looks almost like an error in the CNC, but I don't think it is. I think I made a stupid mistake, which is I put the bit in the collet and tightened it finger tight, and then I got distracted setting up cameras and trying to get, uh, get video of the cutting process, and I forgot to tighten the collet. Uh, so the bit was actually a little bit loose in the collet. If you've watched some of my other videos, including my machining a T-slot faceplate video, I had a similar problem on the milling machine where the uh, cutting bit was slipping, not because I forgot, but because it just wasn't gripping tight enough. This was actually just a mistake. But fortunately, this was a scrap piece. I'm glad I tested it on a piece of scrap. And I'm going to use my second piece of scrap and run it again with a nice tight bit and make sure that it's going to cut okay before I cut it on the real pieces. Here are the results of my second test cut with the first roughing pass, and it looks much better. Now I'm going to switch to my small bit and run the finishing pass around the outsides of the pockets, and uh, we'll see how that works. So here's the second piece, the second test piece where I ran the roughing pass and then came back for a finishing pass with the 132nd inch router bit. So we got nice tight corners on these points. Uh, it all looks uh, good. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. So uh, the next step is going to be to fill these in with epoxy and then sand it down to make the board surface. Well, that wraps up part one. I, uh, I've got all my cherry stock uh, cut to size, milled down, ready to go for the game boards and also for the side pieces of the boxes. And I've also got my CNC program tested out for cutting the inlay points of the backgammon board. So that's all looking pretty good. In part two, I'm going to do the colored inlay on the backgammon boards. So I'm going to mix up colored epoxy and mica powder and inlay it onto the board surfaces in the pockets that I cut with the CNC. I'll also show you how I dye the uh, game pieces. So I've got this collection of uh, little round checkers and um, cribbage pegs that need to be dyed. It's hard to find these commercially in green and purple. You can get them in a variety of colors, but green and purple is kind of tough, and that was the request. So I got plain wood ones, and I'm going to mix up some wood dye and try to dye these green and purple to match the inlay. I hope you enjoyed watching part one, and uh, stay tuned for part two. Thanks for watching.